welcome to Authors at Google, Cambridge edition. Uh, we're very happy today to have two guests from Central Massachusetts, or is it Western? Central Massachusetts with us, Lori Herbelsheimer and Dean Stiglitz. Lori and Dean um, live in Lemonster. Um, quick quiz, birthplace of Johnny Appleseed. And, and the pink flags that like Juan Flamingo. <laughs> oh, and Tupperware. And golden wow. rule honey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they breed and keep bees. They market treatment free honey. They run beekeeping conferences and classes. They write and do research. They're active in the Worcester County Beekeepers Association. They travel around the country speaking about treatment free beekeeping and the importance of the microbial environment in the beehive. Golden Rule Honey LLC is their honey business and they maintain a certified food production facility um, located in the building where the pink plastic flamingo was born. So getting a piece of history with every <laughs> every container. It's very important. The future's in plastics, right? <laughs> yeah. And they package, distribute, and retail honey from uh, their treatment free beekeeping operations. And they produce the queen of chocolate as the king of chocolate. Uh, I feel like I need to meet this, uh, this individual. But it's actually a unique cocoa-free mix of dairy products and sweetened only with honey. Um, and if you want to get in touch with them after this, uh, you can go to their site, which is uh, beanandothers.com, or email them at info at beanandothers.com. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dean and Laurie. I'm really glad to be here at Google, and I'm, I'm hoping that one of, one of you is working on charging my phone over 4G, because the battery keeps dying. Um, we're really happy to be here and talk about um, some things about beekeeping. This is going to be a little bit of a mishmash of a talk. I'm going to cover a lot of different bases, of things that are on our mind that we think are important, and we think that are important um, that other people um, understand as well. So first, a little bit of baseline beekeeping. Um, so a, a few facts and numbers to kind of put the beekeeping industry in this country in perspective. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, op, like the Occupy movement, except the opposite. That 99% of the bees in the U.S. are owned by 1% of the beekeepers. Um, it's not terribly surprising. Some of these beekeepers have 70,000 colonies, but we're talking about somewhere in the order of a, uh, some, somewhere in the order of a thousand beekeepers that are keeping 99% of the bees in this country. Three quarters of the bees in this country, which is of course mostly from these 1,000 beekeepers, um, they uh, they all go to California to pollinate the almonds. That is literally the beehives are loaded on trucks and from all over the country and trucked into the same part of California for the same two three weeks every spring in order to pollinate the almonds. And then all those bees they leave that area and they go everywhere else in the country. And if you were going to design a way to um, to refine new diseases and pathogens and spread them as quickly around the country as possible. Um, you know, it, you know, you know, you know. Did, did anybody else, when they were a kid, you know, get get sent to a chicken pox party, you know, so they could catch chicken pox? That's that's what this almond thing is. Um, it, it really is an incredible um, thing that happens. Another thing that's kind of interesting, that's hard, easy for us to lose sight of, is that the value of hive products has shifted over time. And what I mean by that is that honey hasn't always been, been the thing of value. And honey today isn't the thing of value. The thing of value today is pollination. That's how we feed our country with our monocrop systems that we, that we employ to feed the masses. And I'm not gonna talk too much about that today. Um, but understand that you know, in like colonial England, the wax was what was important. How come? Because they didn't have electric lights. And beeswax candles put out a very bright white light and they don't produce soot. Whereas other other oils and stuff produce soot and you know dirty the air and dirty the walls, so so beeswax was the the important thing, and we went from a, a time when wax was the important product, and now we've got all kinds of substitutes for for the beeswax like electric lights, so then honey became the important thing, but really what's important right now is the is the pollination. Nobody, actually we have, we've got one customer that eats a lot of honey, but aside from him, nobody's going to go hungry if they don't get honey. Um, the other thing that's important is that treating and feeding the bees are, is near universal, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So when I say treatments, talk about 
the reasons that treatments are used. When I talk about treatments, I'm talking about medications. Substances that are put in the hive specifically to fight disease or to, to fight something or to boost something. Um, this particular bee here, if you can see closely right where I'm circling, that, act, that bee actually has a varroa mite on its back. That's an a, a exotic Asian mite that came to this country sometime around 1985. And it really is probably the, the biggest problem that we've got. And, you know, it, it just is, it looks like a little, a little limpet or something sitting on the bee. The, it's a little, um, it's, it's a mite, so it has eight legs. It's a little oval shaped, and you can kind of, if you look closely, not on that picture, but on other pictures, you can kind of see the little legs on the sides. Um, the, aside from mites, and, and that's a varroa mite, which is one type of mite that we have. We also have a tracheal mite, which is a microscopic internal mite. There are also some bacterial infections that, that we have to deal with. There's nosema, and I, I put that in its own category because nosema um, is one of our oldest known um, microbial pathogens. The nosema is what Pasteur was looking at with the with the silkworm larvae um, when he when he kind of figured out that the that the infection was coming from actually this microscopic organism. Um, it's a different kind. There are different kinds of nosema that we have with bees, but it's nosema nonetheless. And nosema is a kind of a funny thing. It's been classified as a fungi in the past. It's now classified as a microsporidium, which the best I can tell you is that's something that's almost like a fungi, but isn't quite. Um, and of course, the overall reason to, to treat is to increase productivity. Now, there are several types of treatments that are used in beehives. Remember, I was talking about treatments that, that they are near universal, that really pretty much anybody keeping bees, whether they're going to a, a hobby beekeeping class or they're a commercial beekeeper, is using some of this stuff. Um, the most obvious stuff are the synthetic chemicals. And um, these are synthetic pesticides, or the same kinds of pesticides, or the same pesticides that are used in agriculture and other areas. Um, fluvalinate is the first one. This is something that, that is used for mites. And it is a pyrethroid, which is a um, synthetic analog of, of a toxin from a, a chrysanthemum flower. There's a lot of different pyrethroids out there. Um, fluvalinate is one of them. Um, Kumaphos. Has anybody, anybody heard the term organophosphate? I don't know that organophosphates are um, a class of pesticides that we're pretty much phased out of as much of agriculture as we possibly can. Would it surprise you to know that cumaphos is a organophosphate that's allowed to be used in beehives that are going to be producing honey for human consumption? Now, hopefully there's not very much of it left in the hive when the, when the honey is being taken out. Um, but th these, are, these are serious synthetic pesticides, the kinds of things that um, that as environmentalists, we're all trying to get out of the environment. Um, but of course, beekeepers are telling farmers not to use some of this stuff while they're putting it in the hives, which makes it a little bit difficult. So those synthetic chemicals, those are just like, there are um, agricultural pesticides. Then we have some antibiotics for the bacterial diseases that we were talking about. Specifically, TM is, is an abbreviation for teramycin, tetracycline, these kind of the standard broad spectrum antibiotics that we're used to in agriculture and in, in human use. And Thailand is a, a newer um, antibiotic that's been introduced because, of course, the bacterial diseases that are being, that teramycin is being used for are becoming resistant to it. So they have to add another antibiotic that lasts a little bit longer. And there's been a third one that's been added there that I forget the name of it. And um, I, haven't, um, I haven't ever used any of these in a hive, so I don't, I, I don't have any direct firsthand experience with them. Um, Fumidil is really interesting. It's classified as an antibiotic, so I have it under there. Um, fumidil is a fungal toxin, like a lot of antibiotics. It's produced by a, um, by a fungus. And it's actually produced by a fungus that causes a di another disease in the beehive. It's a, there's a whole balancing act of all these microbes in the hive. And just like any complex microbial culture, they have antagonistic relationships towards one another. So there's a disease called stone brood. And the causative organism for stone brood produces this toxin called fumidil. Now, fumidil we use against nosema, or, or I, I shouldn't say we again, it's something I've never used. Fumidil is used against nosema. It's really the only thing that works against nosema. Um, it was originally developed as a, for human use, but it was not approved for human use because it causes massive birth defects. And like a lot of fungal toxins, I put this in its own category here because even though it's technically an antibiotic, we're using it against a microsporidium, which is much closer to a, a fungi than a, than a bacteria. Um, but, you know, like a lot of fungal toxins, it has a lot of other weird qualities. The reason it was being developed for human use was it actually restricts blood supply to tumors. 
this isn't something, this isn't what we think of when we think of a broad spectrum antibiotic that kills bacteria. This has a lot of different effects on things. And um, I don't ever want to be in contact with it myself. Then in addition to these treatments, there are what I, what I have in little, little, I should have little finger quotes on there. Um, you know, natural treatments. These are substances that do occur naturally, never, in the, never naturally in the concentrations that are used in the hive as a, as a medication. Um, in the concentrations that they're used, um, the, they're, they're just as unnatural as anything synthetic. That there's just really, nature doesn't concentrate them to that amount, and it, it's, it's a, they're in a concentration that nature doesn't have any way to, to deal with. That th this would never happen in nature. It's kind of, uh, kind of like you know, making 180 proof vodka. Um, yeah, you might get some fruit that ferments a little bit, and you have some alcohol in nature, but that's totally different than Devil Springs vodka, and I, I know that firsthand. Um, so the organic acids are natural treatments. They do occur naturally in the hive and in honey. Um, and therefore, in most cases, they're not detectable in honey as residue because you'd have to determine what was in the honey before and what was added to the honey. They're substances that do occur in honey in varying amounts. And essential oils are a really important one. Um, plants produce essential oils for a very specific reason. They do that in order to prevent microbes and, and insects and other small critters from eating them. They are toxins, um, and, and essential oils are, are used in the hive by a lot of beekeepers, a lot of beekeepers who consider what they're doing natural and sustainable. They certainly consider it more natural and more sustainable and better for the bees than the beekeepers that are using the synthetic chemicals up there. Um, but I don't really, I'm not really convinced that the impacts are, are any um, less of a problem. Um, that the essential oils really, really knock out a lot of the, the microbes, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, although it's not the main focus of this talk, um, the microbial culture in the hive and in the bees is just as important as the bees are for the bees. So what happens when you treat bees? What, what are the impacts? Why am I up here talking to you about treating bees and why I don't think it's right? Well, first of all, it interrupts a, a whole bunch of these uh, abbreviated CAS, com complex adaptive systems. The beehive is one giant set of complex adaptive systems. Um, if anybody's ever, um, you know, the, the, the bees as a colony, they have this very complex relationship uh, behavior that we can observe. But on an individual level, we're looking at little tiny robots with very similar programs. And it's when they get together, and, and it's, a, it's not unlike if anybody's ever read uh, the Isaac Asimov I Robot stories. That when, in the first, first volume, there's one story about these very simple robots that actually work as a, as a little social organization. And I think of that every time I think of the bees. And, and that's how everything happens. There isn't a queen that's, that's sitting on a throne telling everybody what to do. There are all these, you know, when there's more brood in the hive, more baby bees in the hive than they have food to provide for them, then more bees get allocated to, to procuring more food. It really is as simple as that. And so when you put these treatments in the hive, first of all, most of them have, have a, a, not the synthetic, uh, pesticides, but the, but the other ones tend to have very strong scents, and of course the bees communicate with one another through pheromones. They they as a as a super organism body, the communication between individuals is through smell. And when you throw something strong in there, like uh, like vaporized an organic acid or an essential oil that has a very strong smell, you're interrupting um, all that communication that happens between individuals and groups of bees. Um, all this stuff affects the microbes, especially of course the antibiotics. Um, and, and of course, uh, the synthetic pesticides do as well, and, um, and, and unfortunately, so do the nat more natural ones, the, the essential oils and the organic acids. Um, but more importantly, on a, on a, if you take a step back on a bigger scale, we've got this hive of bees, and we're medicating them every year, well, or, or, or every two months, or every three months, or whatever we're doing, to get rid of some, hope, some parasite or, or some disease, we're constantly interfering with the, with the balance between the host and the parasite. We can never, we can never achieve balance because we're constantly pushing in one direction, which is causing the push to come back in the same direct, from the opposite direction. So the direct effects of treatments. Uh, brood loss, it, it, almost all of the treatments that I've listed, almost anything that you can put in the hive has the potential, certainly, to kill some of the young bees. That's not a, that, that isn't a disaster all the time, um, but it does have an impact on the hive. Um, most of them affect fertility, and that's both of queens and of drones, so both, both halves of the, of the mating system. If you have drones that are sterile, or drones that have sperm that's affected, um, that goes and mates with a queen that's supposed to live for three years and store that sperm for that three years, 
if that sperm dies in, in four months, like, like one study out of Virginia Tech has shown, um, then what good has that mating done for a year from now? You've got dead sperm in the queen. She can't produce a viable offspring. Um, it impacts the queen. It's very common that the queen gets replaced after treatments are used. Um, by the bees. Uh, by, by the bees. That, that the, the imbalance and the smells and all that stuff let the bees think that something's wrong. And when something's wrong, you, you always go to the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the microbial impacts, again, it, 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 you know, a lot of these treatments, they, they encourage some microbes and they put back some other microbes. It just it throws off the whole balance of things that keeps things running. Um, it, it perverts the reproductive selection. What bees are we selecting from? If we're, if we're treating them, how do we know which ones we want? If we want bees that, aren't, that don't need to be treated, how do we, you know, even we can have all the metrics in the world about the number of mites, how quickly they build up and all this stuff. But if what we want are bees that can take care of themselves and survive despite the challenges, there's really only one way to measure that metric, and that is to let the bees survive without the challenges and to, as I flippantly say, not breed from the ones that died over the winter. It, it is that simple. Um, and, the treat, and the use of many of these treatments requires more treatments, and I'll talk about that very specific in a couple of specific cases coming up. But we, we sell honey, and we talk to a lot of people all the time, and when we say, oh, we, we, we have honey from bees that are never medicated, they say, well, what about the crops that the bees are foraging on? You know, you, you can't keep all the chemicals out of the hive, and that's absolutely true. But there's been very good work out of Penn State, specifically, that looked at the, at the amount of pesticides and agricultural chemicals in the hive, and what was found was that, by far, the highest levels were the ones that the beekeepers are putting in the hive, which, of course, makes, and, and, and specifically, fluvalinate and kumaphos. Not talking about the more the, the greener stuff. Talk about synthetic pesticides and talking about organophosphates in hives. Um, these are the things that are at the highest level in the hives. So obviously, uh, you know, any of you that have worked on teams, you know, it's the low-hanging fruit that you go for. Well, I can't really dictate what a farmer does or, or what a neighbor does, but I can dictate what I put in the hive. So beekeepers can actually control what goes in the hive. So that's a really a good reason why we ought to control what it is, because it's the, the highest levels. We've got a lot of issues with the synergistic effects of some of these pesticides with other agricultural chemicals. That some of these, something like fluvalinate, when it gets combined with a fungicide that's being used in the field, it can increase in toxicity to bees. And in some cases, it's been reported as much as a thousand times. Um, that's a problem, but it isn't just the farmer's problem. It's a little bit, you know, the example I like to use is, you know, if you if you walk to work every day and there's a bus that comes by and and every time that bus goes by, a cloud of exhaust comes, you know, right in your face, and you start coughing, and and you know, and you, you complain, I'm gonna I'm gonna be sick from this, and I'm not well. Well, that you might have a case there, but if you're also smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, you're gonna have a little bit more trouble making that case. Um, and that's one of the problems is once we start talking about synergistic effects, we the beekeepers have to take some responsibility for that. And. <coughs> There's a lot of controversy about what pesticides are doing what to what bees and, and, and how, what, what effects they have on the environment. But only when all the contamination that's coming into the hive is coming in from the outside and not being put there by the beekeeper are we going to have any clue what's actually going on and what, uh, what things have what effect. So now I'll talk a little bit about feeding because I, I, as, a, as you'll see, feeding is also a, a universal practice among beekeepers. There's a bunch of reasons for feeding. Most obviously is to prevent starvation. You know, that's, that's not a terrible reason to feed the bees. Um, feeding is also done to replace harvested stores. The honey gets taken off in the, in the fall, then the bees are fed, you know, generally around here we, we don't have a whole lot of beekeepers that, that are big enough operations that they're buying truckloads of high fructose corn syrup, but that's the common practice. And what you'll see is certainly white sugar, table sugar, just being mixed into a syrup and being fed to the bees for them to overwinter on so that the beekeeper can have the honey on their breakfast table. I think the, the bees want the honey on their breakfast table. They don't want that refined sugar just as much as we don't want it. If there was no difference, we wouldn't be doing all this work. We'd be just taking that refined sugar and putting it on the breakfast table and skipping the honey and letting the bees keep it. Um, feeding can be done to stimulate the bees sometimes in the, under the proper circumstances, a small amount of feeding does a great job of stimulating the bees to go out and, um, and actually collect honey. Um, stimulation is a great reason to feed the bees. Of course, it doesn't have to be um, artificial sugar. It could be honey. Um, 
most one of the most important reasons for feeding is to increase the carrying capacity of an area. Because what we get in nature from the flowers, which is where the bees get the nectar, is we get what we what beekeepers call honey flows. That's a time in an area when there's a lot of nectar available. Well, when there's a lot of nectar available, when there's a flow going on, you almost can't have too many hives in an area. There's more for the bees to collect than you could fit bees in there. So you're not going to run out of food. Everybody's, you know, you got 100 hives there, they're all gaining weight, they're all storing honey. Well, that's fine. But we've got the flip side of that coin, which is the dearth. So you've got that same area, you've got that same 100 hives, and maybe, you know, there's rarely nothing blooming, but maybe there's only enough forage in that area to, to support five hives, not 100. Well, what you're going to see is all the hives losing population and losing their stores because it isn't there. And so feeding it, to increase the carrying capacity of the area, what I'm talking about is feeding the bees during a dearth in order to be able to take advantage of the flow, in order to have the large population of bees for the flow. Um, and of course, the, the most common reason to feed bees is to produce more bees. Again, we have, we're talking about the almond pollination in California. That happens in February. In order to have large numbers of bees to do pollination in February, you have to start building them up in November. And you start building them up in November when, if left to their own devices, they'd be winding down to, to, to not hibernate, but to be a little bit dormant during the winter. And we're doing the opposite to them. So producing more bees, that's what you do when you want to do almonds, and it's what you do when you want to have bees to sell. When you're part of the package industry in, in the south or in California, they have bees that they feed a lot, that turn into more bees so they can sell bees. And in fact, those are the characteristics that those bees are, are bred for, is to be able to feed them and have them reproduce. Because remember, the product is pollination, it isn't honey. And if the product is pollination, you want to have, be able to get numbers of bees almost on demand. So, as I said, of course, feed is not equivalent to honey. Um, it's very common around here. We get, in, in, in the middle of summer, we get a dearth. And it's very common around here for beekeepers to just toss f feed on, sugar on the hives as soon as there's a dearth. So they can keep the numbers up. And it's, a, it's not a ridiculous theory, but what they're trying to do is to keep the population up so when the next honey flow comes, they have enough bees to collect that honey. Because each bee in our lifetime can only collect about a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So it really is about having a large number of bees when that nectar is available. Um, feeding affects the microbial culture as much like um, the, the treatments do. Um, but most importantly, it prevents the selection for bees that, bees that don't require feeding. We overwinter some very small colonies. And when they come out of winter, they, they started out full of honey. And when they come out of winter still with stores, we know that they didn't consume very much honey over the winter because where, where would they have gotten it if it wasn't in that one box? And what we found is that as, as we're selecting bees to survive in this area, that they are being selected for frugality, for not going through a whole lot of stores in the wintertime. Whereas the bees that you purchase generally do go through a lot of stores because they're designed to feed and turn it into, into, into young bees. Um, and of course, feed can easily get into honey. Uh, we've tested honey off the, we've had honey tested off the shelf and found up to 30% bee sugar in honey that was $11 a pound and supposedly from an organic farm in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know, my contention is that if beekeepers really wanted to keep the feed out of the honey, really wanted to keep that sugar syrup, whether it's beet sugar or, or corn sugar or cane sugar out of the honey, they'd flavor it or they'd color it so that if it got into the honey, they'd know it and they wouldn't sell the honey. Nobody does that. And, they do, they, and everybody claims that not much sugar gets into the honey, but nobody really, nobody really tries to verify that. Um, when it's done conscientiously, it, it does not get into the honey. Um, it's very easy not to do it conscientiously. And of course, when you're running a big operation, every visit to the bee yard costs you something. And so you tend to kind of stack, stack things on top of each other. And so, and so you, put, you, you put your feeders on and you put your honey supers on at the same time. And that's actually fairly common um, practice. So, one thing I'd like to talk to you about is bees being wild animals, and not domesticated livestock. You know, bees are wild, and I think they should stay wild. It's their wildness that makes them valuable to us. We often get this question, how do you get the bees to come home? Um, this picture is actually of some of our hives on the roof of the restaurant at the Intercontinental Hotel, right on the waterfront. Um, and bees come home because that's where their nest is. 
That's, as, as individuals, they don't really exist. They exist as part of the superorganism. Well, what's in the hive? Well, the queen's in the hive. All their comb is in the hive. Their food stores are in their hive. Their young are in the hive. Their future's in the hive. Everything's in the hive. So getting the bees to come home is not hard, as long as you get them established in their home first. So some of the things that make bees wild is that unlike livestock, the bees, they, they pretty much feed and care for themselves, and they're not confined. They go out and they fly. They might fly three miles away from the hive and come back, or even further. Um, so this picture, of course, you can see a bee foraging on a, on a sunflower. I think this is in the, um, in the, on the Greenway Park. Um, and this is actually pollen that the bees have, have stored in the comb, and it's actually being fermented. And the fermented pollen, when they ferment it, just like anybody here ever made pickles, like, you know, not vinegar pickles, but, you know, like lacto-fermented pickles, they get sour, they get preserved, but more importantly, the, the process of fermentation, and the, this is a process of, of, of microorganisms, specific, mostly fungi and bacteria, actually transforming the substance of the pollen into substances that the bees need outside of the bee's body. They're, they're actually synthesizing proteins and, um, and, the, and they're synthesizing enzymes that they actually need and that they can't get anywhere else um, from this process of fermentation. It's not just about storage, it's about increasing the nutrition. Also, unlike other livestock, bees retain the resources to protect themselves. You know, that one's, I think, fairly straightforward. That, uh, that's the, the bees main means of protecting itself or the one that, the one that, that we recognize. Um, but I also wanted to include this picture. And this is a bee that has come back from the field and on her hind legs where normally she stores pollen, where, where normally we see pollen being brought into the hive, that's actually plant resin, that's propolis. What, 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 what's going to become propolis, which is the plant resins that the bees refine. They use it to coat the inside of the hive, they use it to, to stiffen the comb. They use it to, to glue the, 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 the stuff together. Glue yeah. They use it to glue things together. They use it to reduce the size of their entrance, to fill in cracks. They use it for everything. But what's important is, remember, we were talking a little bit about essential oils and that, the, that plants produce essential oils in order to keep things from eating them. Well, when they, when they analyzed the honeybee genome a couple years ago, what they found that was surprising, the most surprising thing that we found, was that there was almost no gene, there was no almost no immune system for a social insect that lives in this tight colony with you know 50,000 or 100,000 individuals in close quarters and all rubbing against each other and going out in the field and picking up who knows what and coming back that they really didn't have much in the way of an immune system the way we understand it. But what the bees do is they they have the social immunity and what they do is they collect these plant resins which have substances in them that that protect the plant. And, they, and they're really appropriating the defense mechanism of the plant and using it in their hive for themselves, which is really kind of brilliant. And of course, um, if you've you know, studied the history of medicine or, or, or know anything about natural medicine, propolis is one of the oldest human med medicines as well. Um, well. I won't go into the detail of that, but if you, uh, you can, of course, Google it or, or ask Jeeves or, or whatever you do around here. Um, but it, but it, it's very good stuff. Um, and, and very powerful. Um, and the, you know, as one re as as one um, genius researcher um, remarked, well, you know, if if the if the if if it's good for the humans, if humans use it and have medical benefits, maybe the bees are using it for a specific reason. Well, that's why we're using it. Um, the other thing is that unlike livestock, bees are adaptable without domestication. We don't really have to, you know. Take these, you know, we don't have to domesticate wildebeest into something that'll live in a barn and, and get milked. Um, bees, they move into cavities on their own. Um, this is actually a ceiling in West Roxbury. This is a colony that we removed there. And this is a, a telephone pedestal in, in Florida, in South Florida. Anywhere where there's a cavity, the bees will move in. Um, so it doesn't really take much to convince them to move into a box. They're pretty happy to do that. The other thing that is kind of worth noting is that bees are fascinating. Uh, you know, obviously, we're all here, so there's some interest in bees, and, and, and all of us who wouldn't be in this room. Um, but when I say bees are fascinating, um, they, they capture our imagination. And when you look in a hive, when you, when you look at something like this, this is actually a piece of comb that was in a wall that we were removing in Florida. 
But if you've ever looked in a beehive, um, or seen pictures of a beehive, or seen an observation hive, you see you have these parallel combs. And the bees are living on the comb and in between the comb. And when you, when you observe the hive, you open it up, and the bees don't totally freak out because you're taking their home apart, because whoever took their home apart before we showed up, they've got 50, 000, uh, 50 million years of, of, of not having anybody open up their hive gently. You know, just, just you know, a bear ripping it apart is one thing, but somebody gently smoking them and taking the hive apart, what we're able to see is, is it's, it's almost like reading a book, that each comb is like a page of this book. And as you move through the combs, you can see all of these different processes that we recognize as happening in, in all life. We see how they, how they assimilate and digest food, how they rear their young, how they, how they reproduce. Um, we can see them out in the field, you know, doing their thing, collecting the carbohydrates from the flowers and, and the propolis and the, and the, and the pollen. Um, we can, we can see all this stuff and we can see their stress response but as we've got the hive open for a long time. We can hear them starting to get a little bit um, agitated and annoyed. Um, and so it, it, it's very much like reading a book and it's very much like reading a children's book where you're looking at, um, at an organism and each cell in the organism is kind of animated into a little character that has little antennae and, and little wings that goes around um, and, and does their part of the, of the process. They go out and they they bring a little bit of nectar back and they hand it off to another bee. And that bee takes that nectar and goes and puts it into a cell. And then, and then another bee comes along and refines that nectar into honey. And then another bee comes along and takes some of that and eats it so they can go and, 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 and generate heat somewhere else in the colony. Um, we can actually observe all this stuff. We're observing it in, a, in, an, in an organism the way we're used to um, really almost requires computer, computer animation. On an even larger scale, remember plants don't have legs and they have a hard time moving. Um, bees kind of facilitate the mating dance between plants. They move the pollen from one flower to another, not, not for all plants, but for many plants. And um, they're, they're kind of acting as, the, um, as kind of a third party in the, um, in the, pollen, in the, in the mating of, of all these plants in this system of flowers that require pollinators, bees being one of the major pollinators. This is a very old system, not quite as old as the microbial foundation of, of life, but it's kind of the next step up of kind of life as we know it. This is the foundation. The plants produce the sugar from the sun, and sugar, that sugar that's produced by the, um, by the plants, by the, by the chlorophyll, that's really the currency that, that life trades on. That sugar gets traded all up and down the food chain. And of course, you know, Anybody that's spent time watching bees, you know, knows that, that they're kind of quirky and they're kind of fun to watch, and they and they capture our imagination and they, and they make an interesting lens to look through the look at the natural world because they do things so differently than we do, but they're social like we are, and they do things so differently than you know than other kinds of insects or other you know mice or other animals that we have. Yet, even though mice are a lot more like us in, in many ways, a lot of social behavior stuff in humans is actually modeled in bees. So, a few things about beekeeping in Massachusetts today is that, that land use has, has changed quite a bit. Um, Massachusetts used to be a, a major center for beekeeping. The first Italian honeybees to be, uh, the first Italian queens to be imported into the U.S. were imported into Massachusetts, into Coleraine, which is in the, the western part of the state. Um, but what's happened, of course, is development. We know all about development. And that's gotten rid of a lot of land. But, and I use the term tree hugging here, not in the traditional sense. The other thing that's happened is places that used to be open fields, that used to have a lot of wildflowers and a lot of nature. Well, when I was a kid growing up in this area, they used to burn them every few years to keep them open. And they stopped doing that for the most part. And what happens is, of course, trees grow up. And once there are trees, nobody wants to cut the trees down. There's a huge resistance to cutting the tree. And the, the idea that you're going to cut a tree down makes you not an environmentalist for some reason. Um, even though you, you want a different environment, the environment that was there before. Um, and that's a, that's a big problem because areas that used to be able to support bees, because of the green influence, they, trees have been allowed to grow up and now they're not so good for bees anymore. And we don't really have a way to handle it. Um, the other issue is, you know, while the land use and the tree hugging has been happening, we've had a few invasive plants that have turned into excellent honey producers. Purple blue strife and Japanese knotweed. What two invasive plants does the state spend money trying to eradicate? 
purple loose strife, and Japanese knotweed. I'm not advocating that, that we let these things grow wild. I'm just saying that from a beekeeper's perspective, these two things have been happening. And this has kind of been our savior. And now it's, and, and now it's a problem. Now, it may just be that we don't have the budget to fight this stuff anymore, and, and it will take care of its, uh, itself. I don't really have a good solution for this problem, but it's one worth pointing out. And recently, we've been thinking about, are there any un un are there unexploited resources in the state? And one thought that, that has come to mind is the, the power line right-of-ways. Um, they do use herbicides on them periodically, I think every three years, but kind of trying to put together a little plan of, of, of some way to utilize, because that's excellent honey-producing land. It's all young plants, you know, things like sumac and wildflowers, everything's low. There's plenty of sunlight because it's kept clear. Um, the, this is really something, and, and we'd have to work out a way that we could move the bees out of the areas that are going to have the herbicide treatments, and th there's a lot of infrastructure that would have to go into this. But this is one of the plans that we're trying to look into as, as a way to increase um, our beekeeping operation here in Massachusetts. So, a few things that you don't know about beekeeping, but you should. Treatments are universal and feeding is universal. Almost to a T. Almost every beekeeper, whether they're a hobbyist or a commercial beekeeper, feeds and treats. The selection criteria for breeding stock is skewed towards the production of almond and packaged bee production. And this is what I was just talking about, that they are bees that, that are being bred for the quality of, if you feed them, they make more bees. That's different than bees that can take care of themselves and can regulate their populations to the environment. We had about an 80% die-off of, of bees in Massachusetts last winter, according to our state bee inspector. Um, that's significant. We have, we've got a lot of beekeepers in the state, but most of them are hobby beekeepers with one or two hives. Um, we did a little bit better than 80%, not a whole lot better. I think probably about 60% die-off with our own colonies um, last winter. But our bees were never artificially fed and they were never medicated. So I feel like we're a little bit ahead of the eight ball there um, because the, the bulk of those bees are medicated. And if they're being medicated and they're being fed and there's still an 80% die-off, there's something wrong with, with that procedure. Um, and people that, if you're buying honey from somebody who's a beekeeper and they never run out of honey, then you've got to suspect that they might be buying in honey from sometimes. Um, and people are, generally aren't open, o open about that. Um, our model is a little bit different. And in fact, when we're done, We've got some honey for you all to taste as well. Um, now, there's a very strong movement out there that wants to ban neonicotinoid insecticides um, as a way to save the bees. This is something that's kind of swept through Europe um, and through the US. Um, as far as I can tell, it's mostly through very um, anti-corporate gr uh, green groups that, that are promoting this. And they do a very disingenuous thing that by definition, you know, at least at this point, we don't have a cause for CCD, colony collapse disorder. We don't have something that we can say this is what causes it. Nobody has been able to replicate, replicate it in the field and say, I did this and the, and the bees died in a consistent, the, the consistent manner as they do to colony collapse disorder. This is what causes it. There's a lot of, th there's, and I'll get into that later. But, what, but what's happened is that, that there's been a, a move to kind of muddy the waters a little bit. And so what happens is neonicotinoids, the, these, these, this class of uh, insecticides, there have definitely been overt pesticide poisonings that have killed a lot of bees from them, mostly through the, the dust they produce when they plant them. Um, this is hopefully something that's being worked on and something that's going to get better over time. You know, if we have a problem, we like to work on it and we like to solve it. But the problem is that in those cases, is definitely not CCD because it's, it's over pesticide poisoning. We know what the cause is. They were exposed to a pesticide and they died. So what happens is they like to kind of squish these two groups together and say, okay, we have these bees that died from colony collapse disorder that we don't know what, what caused it. But we think it's, from, we think it's from neonicotinoids even though we can't find the neonicotinoids in the, in the dying or dead colonies. Then we've got these bees that died from overt pesticide poisoning. And we think that, and, and since we think that that overt pesticide poisoning is CCD, we're going to mush them all together and say that both groups together all died from pesticides and they all died from CCD. Therefore, CCD is pesticide poisoning. This is the, this is the logic and it, and it isn't true. Um, and, and it doesn't do any favors. That, that We're really at a point where when we talk about CCD, we're talking about things that are unexplained. We're not talking about overt pesticide poisoning. And um, 
you know, when the, the Penn State work that I was talking about earlier that looked at the pesticides in the hive, when they found those extremely high levels of the beekeeper applied pesticides in the hive, what they were looking for was the neonicotinoids. They, they assumed they were going to find them. The, this was in 2008. Colony collapse disorder was big in the news. It was a new thing. And, and the, the, the theory that, that these pesticides that, that were becoming more and more prevalent were the one, and, and that were very toxic to the bees and that, and that the bees are exposed to um, caused this die-off was what everybody expected to find. But the studies haven't backed it up. And, it, and that's been problematic for those that have, have wanted to stick by that story. Um, obviously, um, by this point, cell phones. You know, we heard that cell phones were, were killing the bees and cell phone towers were disorienting them. That was a, there was a German study on not cell phones but wireless phones. And it was mistranslated um, and then made all the media here in this country that cell phones were killing the bees. It just simply isn't true. Um, did anybody here see this story about I don't know, about a, a month or a month and a half ago, I think it was in Oregon, was all these bumblebees died in the Target parking lot. Yeah, there, there, there were, I think they had 17 linden trees in this parking lot, and they were sprayed with one of these neonicotinoid insecticides. And they had 25,000 bumblebees die, and they were calling it a disaster. Well, I'd like to just offer a little bit different perspective on that. You've got a Target parking lot with seven, you planted 17 trees to attract, bee, to attract pollinators you got 25,000 bumblebees that showed up. We're told the, that all these native pollinators are in decline and they, and they don't exist in the wild, but you got this parking lot. Not only were there 25,000 bumblebees there, but they had to put nets over the trees because they estimated there were another 25,000 that were in danger of picking up the pesticide. So you got one target parking lot with 17 trees attracting 50,000 bumblebees. Um, I don't think things are quite as grim as we're told they are. Um, the other example on that same line is, is we um, have bees at the Intercontinental Hotel, which is right along the Greenway, and we do a farmer's market um, on the Greenway. And I'm amazed, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the Greenway wasn't so green, that there were, you know, big green steel structure, but not green in, in that sense. And uh, I, you know, I go around and I take pictures of our honeybees and the flowers in, on the Greenway, because I'd like to show those to the people at the Intercontinental and show them what their bees are doing. Well, what's been amazing? the number of native pollinators that have shown up there. Now, I know why the honeybees are there. I got bees on the roof a quarter mile away. But really, you know, if you build it, they will come. All they had to do was, was build this park, plant flowers in the middle of the city, even though it's in the middle of the city, and all these bumblebees and wasps and all, all these you know, tiny native pollinators, all these pollinators just showed up. Um, so again, I don't think things are quite as grim as, as they may appear if one reads the media. Um, fungicides aren't supposed to hurt bees. And in fact, fungicides are allowed to be used on a lot of crops on the open bloom, the bloom that, that is designed for the bee to visit, so, so that the bees are actually being asked to, to be exposed to the, these fungicides and bring them back to the hive. I think one report was that um, hives coming off the cranberries in southern Massachusetts had uh, 7,000 parts per billion of, of a fungicide in the, in the bees when they came off. Um, but there's more and more studies that are showing um, even though the fungicides don't just kill the bees outright like a pesticide, like an insecticide does, it affects their ability to raise queens, it affects the reproductive ability, um, it affects a lot of stuff. And it, it affects their food supply. Remember the, the fermented pollen? Well, if, you're, if you need fungi to do the fermentation and you've got uh, fungicides in there, it's kind of like brewing beer with a, you know, trying to brew beer and putting, putting a yeast killer in the vat. It doesn't really work. Um, Insecticides other than neonicotinoids, and I talk about this because how many here have gotten a, a petition in the, on their email that says, "Oh, we, we need to ban these these neonicotinoid pesticides." Sign this petition. Well, you go ahead and you sign that petition, and I know we're all very well-meaning when we do that, but do you think that means that the farmers that are being banned from using the pesticide that they want to use are going to not use any pesticide? The reason that we move to these neonicotinoids is they don't require the kind of aerial broadcasting. Of, of crop dusters that, that we kind of are used to historically. And believe me, there were a lot of beehives that died from those kinds of, of pesticides. Um, the idea that you're going to ban one class of pesticide, you've got to look and see what is going to be used in its place and is it going to be any better for the bees? And I think the answer is no. Um, the treatments, obviously, I've talked a lot about the, why I think the treatments are bad and why I think the treatments are a problem. The feeds are a problem. Another real issue is the science. And, and although um, Lori and I are not um, trained scientists, we do, we, we're not stupid and we, we understand English and I have a, 
I have a mind where I, I, I can read scientific studies and I can understand them and I can find the, find the flaw. Um, and there's always a flaw, especially when you're dealing with biological systems. It's not quite like, uh, like growing a crystal or something like that in a laboratory environment. Um, but we've, gotten, we've really gotten the shaft from the scientists with the bees. And a couple that I'd like to just point out, um, Jeff Pettis, who is the top bee researcher with the USDA, and, and, you know, he's, he's, the, he's our national bee scientist. He's the guy. He did a study that showed that, that undetectable levels of neonicotinoid pesticides make the bees more susceptible to a, a, a disease, to nosema, the disease we were talking about earlier. And, and, and what? Well, well, because they know well, well, because they because they know what they put in, and they and they know it was diluted. So, but here's the problem: what they did, what they did essentially is they they took a hive of bees. They did this with with you know they had controls and, and experimental colonies, but they take a hive of bees, and for the experimental colonies, they'd actually give them this tiny dose of of neonicotinoid insecticide. Then after a week or some period of time, they collected bees from that hive and put them in a cage. And they, kept those, and they fed those bees for 30 days in the cage. And what they did is, is for some of them, they exposed them to Xenoshima, and some of them, they didn't. Okay? And the idea was to see if the bees from the hives that had this very tiny dose of an insecticide had more Nosema than the bees that didn't. Now, before the study was published, Jeff Pettis was, was interviewed in a European film um, talking about this, and, and, and uh, he wouldn't, you know, this is before the study was released. He wouldn't discuss it with anybody in this country. Well, when the study was finally released and I got a chance to read it, what I found, and it's not very hard to find, it's very straightforward if you read the, 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 the procedure. In that time period where the bees were, exposed, were caged and put it, exposed to the nosema, that, there were 30 days, I believe it was, that before they tested the end result. Any bees that died in that period of time, in that 30 days, were discarded and they were never tested to see if they had nosema. They had one, you know, one whole control set that all died in the cage, and they never tested them. Now, if those bees had nosema, whether or not that's what killed them, it would have made the results of this study exactly the opposite. They just threw away the data that didn't fit neatly, or, or that they were afraid wouldn't fit neatly into, into what they were looking at. You, know, you, you, can't, you can't do science that way. It doesn't, it doesn't help anything. Um, in addition, we've got some, some other studies. Tom Seeley is an excellent researcher at Cornell and has done some incredible work on swarming, the, the, the definitive work on, on swarming behavior. Um, he did a study um, regarding some of, the, some of our practices that we do, and um, he claimed that, that all of his colonies, this is controls and experimentals, never raised a single drone, never raised a single male bee throughout the entire experimental period, throughout the entire year. Just simply isn't believable to anybody that's kept bees. If you have bees that aren't raising, raising drones, there's something weird going on. Drones are from unfertilized eggs. Even if the queen wasn't mated, she'd be raising drones. Even if the sperm wasn't viable, she'd be raising drones. Um, this was a way to just make the data a little bit easier to digest. Um, and then in, a, in another case, uh, Dr. Liu, this is a, a study that came out of the Harvard um, Harvard School of Public Health that's had a lot of press um, nationally, internationally, and here in, in the Boston area. Um, if you look at, the, at what was reported in their study um, for the management of the bees, they started out the year in March with hives that were full of bees and full of honey. They fed them every week. They never took any honey out. They never gave them more room. The bees never swarmed. They, they were full come fall. They were, and, and then within a month of them having, you know, 14 frames of, of honey, which is like more than the bees need to go through the winter, within a month of that, they were, fe they were feeding them again. None of this, none of this makes any sense. That if, if you have, in March, if you have a full hive of bees, they're going to swarm. They're going, that colony is going to reproduce. And it just isn't, what, what they, you know, it, if you see this with one hive or something, that, you know, that's one thing. But if your entire experiment are these bees that were so strong that they should have swarmed and they should have produced honey and they should have needed more room and none of those things happened, it just isn't believable. And it, it makes it difficult to accept anything that they say. The other one that really gets me is we get a, a lot of studies with bees that only are looking at one or two hives or five hives or something. And then they, they use these, you know, math, and I'm, I'm not a math guy, um, 
but they, they use statistics to try to say, okay, we only had five hives, but we can use the, we can we can apply all this math and determine how representative those five hives are of some whole that we don't that we haven't measured and we don't know what the characteristics are. I simply don't believe it. And um, yes. So what would you counter? They have to observe every hive in the world. No, but 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 the pro the the problem is with bees. No matter how experienced a beekeeper you are, if you start two hives next to each other with as close to the same lineages as possible, the same equipment, you know, exactly the same as, as you know, to laboratory standards exactly the same as possible, and, and manage them exactly the same throughout the season, they are not going to look the same at the end of the season. So you have a problem that you haven't correlated your controls. And in fact, um, in a later slide, I'll point out that the, one of the things that I think needs to happen is I think that there need to be multiple control groups that get done. Because multiple control groups will show you very quickly if your statistics are, are dishonest. And I'm not saying that they're always dishonest. You're, you're probably the, the guy that does the statistics here at Google. Um, but uh, but you know, when you're looking at three hives or five hives and you try to make this broad sweeping thing and you, and you have all this math, and then you say that, okay, well, we only had five hives, but we can extrapolate what, the, what a thousand hives looks like. Three hives isn't enough to do that, no matter how good your math is. Um, and the problem with all of this with the research is there's no good solution in sight. You know, you're the researcher. You made a mistake. Let's say you made a mistake. Let's say you know you made a mistake or you did something sloppy. Can you admit it? No. Who's going to fund your next study? If you, if, if you say, oh, the la that study that I just spent three years on that somebody else paid for, um, I screwed up and the data isn't relevant, but I have this other study that I really want to do and I need money for it. Um, it makes it difficult, and of course, there's all kinds of reputations at stake as well. So what is the inevitable outcome of mainstream practice? Um, honey that isn't pure, because the, the, the feeding is, is so ubiquitous. Um, so. When I say honey that isn't pure, I talk about sugar that gets into the honey, feed that gets into the honey. That's something different than somebody purposely mixing a cheaper sugar in with the honey, which also happens. Um, and these beekeeper applied treatments can get into the honey as well. And that can be a pro more of a problem or less of a problem depending on the beekeeper and the procedures used. Really what we're going to end up is bees that actually require treatments. So I talked about, you know, if we treat the bees, we can't select for bees that, that don't require the treatments and we're, and, you know, any kind of resistance mechanism has a metabolic cost to the colony. So if we remove those kinds of challenges, we're selecting against those kinds of strategies because the, that metabolic cost doesn't get them anything. But really, and this is kind of interesting, is that there are specific treatments that literally become the treatment treadmill. That you use this treatment and you have to use more treatments. Um, antibiotics. When I'm talking about for American fowl brood is a very specific disease. It is a bacterial infection that produces spores, and the spores can live for 40 years in the hive. So what happens is beekeepers use antibiotics in the hive to, to kill the live organism. And once you start that cycle and you've got this healthy population of spores in the hive, well, those spores are constantly germinating. And if you're not constantly using the antibiotics, then you constantly have this infection that's blooming, and that's a problem. Fumidil, which is that stuff for Nosema that I was talking about, what the, the new studies have shown is that, that yes, using Fumidil actually does reduce the Nosema infection in an individual bee. But when you have low doses of Fumidil in the hive, like after it's dissipated, sometime after the treatment, you know what it does? It, it, it actually stimulates the, the, the Nosema that's left to produce more spores. So it's actually a stimulant to reproducing this thing that you used the treatment for in the first place. So as, you know, as the concentration dips down, you've got more spores, the, 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 the infection shows up again, you use the fumidil again, and it never ends. Um, we end up resi with resistant diseases and stronger parasites, and we end up with bees that require feeding. Um, one of the other kind of activist things that comes up is there's this company called Biologics that has that has tried to produce a, uh, a vaccine for, for a virus in bees um, using this, this RNAi technology, which you can, there's a pretty good Wikipedia article on RNAi if you're interested. Um, but what, how it's been, how it's been the, how the narrative has been from the activists that want you to rally against Monsanto is that, oh, there was this small company that was looking out for the health of the bees called Biologics, and they were, and they were bought out by the evil Monsanto. Um, if you do a little bit of homework, 
this company was started by people who do startups and sell companies. Familiar with the model? Um, it was started by a guy who developed this technology, um, this RNAi technology, which is, which is useful. I mean, th this it's a whole new technology for for agriculture, for medicine. Uh, not clear what the downside is yet, um, but but uh, basically what was happening is that he had this technology, and actually insects are an easy way to demonstrate this technology because they can ingest the the substance and, and incorporate it. Um, and at the time that they were coming out with this, the colony collapse, this 2008 colony collapse disorder was big, and there was a virus that was being implicated called is acute, uh, Israeli acute paralysis virus. And so they developed a vaccine against this virus, um, it, which probably is somewhat effective, um, and claimed that they could solve CCD. But of course, since we learned, we've since learned that CCD is not really correlated with Israeli acute paralysis virus. Um, but what, what I just wanted to, to get across to you is that, that this is, these are part of the same animal. This isn't something nice that was co-opted by the big bad Monsanto. Um, and what's going to happen is that, it, what I think is going to happen if they end up using this, is that every year they'll go to the almonds where three quarters of the bees congregate, where you can get samples very easily, and they'll sample and find all the diseases that are in the populations of bees that year, much like we do with the flu, you know, kind of like the flu vaccine. And then they'll have a product that beekeepers can buy that have the up-to-date stuff with the up-to-date uh, vaccines. And the problem with that is, you know, how, how do you compete with that? If, if you really have bees that are resistant to every disease that comes up for bees and every parasite that comes up for bees, we're definitely going to lose our wild bees because how can you compete with that? It's just easy to keep bees at that point. Um, what happens to native pollinators that have to compete with bees that don't have to face challenges and don't have to expend energy on resistance and to these challenges? And what happens to the gene pool of bees over time if, if we're not selecting bees that, that actually have an ability to adapt to challenges? Well, we know what happens. I'm almost done here. So a little sanity check on CCD. Um, there are increased losses. There are many reasons for these losses, including pesticides including fungicides, including disease, including mites. Um, unlike what, what you may have heard, there is capacity for more bees than we have. Commercial beekeepers can produce more bees if they need them. We're not, we're not at any kind of tipping point where, we, where we're out of bees. The number of colonies is largely a product of market forces. Um, at this point, the almond, po the almond pollination is the thing that runs the beekeeping industry. And, and, and at you know, $200 a hive for, for three weeks rental, um, a beekeeper is very motivated to, to produce more bees to bring to the almonds if the market's there for it. And, and, you know, whereas some years we do have a little bit of trouble getting all the almonds pollinated, nobody's starving because we don't get all the almonds pollinated. This isn't the kind of crop that, that people are, are eating to survive. And the other thing that you have to understand is that they're planting almond trees faster than they have water to water them with. So some years, the almond growers are actually renting beehives for almond trees that are never going to produce almonds because they don't have water. Well, why do they do that? Because they have crop insurance. In order to collect on the crop insurance, they have to do everything that they're supposed to do in order to try to secure the crop, including renting the bees, even if they know that they don't have any water to produce the almonds. Um, there are certainly some businesses that are in trouble. This is what happens in industries, the computer industry, the information industry. You know, We see companies fall by the wayside all the time. There's nothing unhealthy about that. Um, but you know, agriculture, we're dealing with nature. And um, agriculture is always trying to produce more with less. Not much different than a lot of kinds of businesses. Um, but you can't cure the horse. And you can't cure the horse. You, you know, the story about the, the very frugal gentleman that bought a horse. And the guy he bought it from said, well, give him one, one pail of, of oats every day for feed. Well, this, this frugal gentleman didn't really like the idea of, of feeding all these oats to the, to the horse. So the first day he gave him the, the full bucket of oats. And the second day he gave him a half a bucket of oats. Third day he gave him a quarter of a bucket of oats. And every day he cut it in half and the horse was doing fine. Then one day he saw the guy who, who sold him the horse and he told him that it was his plan. And the guy said, well, you know, you let me know how that works out. So he ran into the guy who sold him the horse and the, and the guy said, hey, how's that horse doing? He said, ah. He said, you know, you know, he, he died. He said, I don't, I don't know what happened. You know, I had him down to to one grain of oats a, a, a day, and I was going to give him a half a grain the next day, you know, I almost had him cured. You know, you can't cure the horse, and at some point when you're dealing with agriculture, you're dealing with nature, 
or you're dealing with people, you can't get more with less. And at some point, you hit the wall, and that's, that really has been what ha has happened with the beekeeping industry, tangled up with some other things with pesticides and other agriculture issues that are going on. So what can you all do to help the bees? You can support sustainable models of beekeeping. And I would submit that there's no sustainable model of beekeeping that includes artificial feeds and medications. There's, no matter how, no matter how you want to do your accounting, there's nothing sustainable about producing cane sugar in South America, refining it, shipping it up to New England to feed your bees so that you can extract some honey out of the hive that they produced. There's, even if you can make that work on paper money-wise, there's nothing sustainable about that. Um, this is actually, that's Kirk Webster. If anybody uh, has read the new Bill McKibben book, Oil and Honey, Kirk is the, half the book is about Bill McKibben and the other half is about Kirk. He's one of the beekeepers whose honey we sell. Be a critical thinker and don't buy into all the mass marketed hype. And I mean that especially with the email stuff that you read. I, you know, I, I wish it were so simple that you could just click and, and like click on a petition and like make things better. But it isn't, and things don't get better unless you put yourself out. Clicking on a, on a petition, even if it's a good petition, doesn't really do any good because the person that's reading it knows that all you had to do was click on it. Recognize that beekeeping and agricultural practices vary widely, and different practices and ideals have different roles in our overall system. And I say that because I don't want to vilify the migratory beekeepers. They're doing an important job. They're, they are feeding the masses of the country. Um, we have this monocrop system that requires, you know, when we talk about monocrops, we're talking about an area where there's only one thing growing. When there's only one thing growing, it only blooms for two weeks during the year, where it needs insect pollinators. For the other 50 weeks of the year, there's nothing for pollinators to eat. There's nothing to sustain them. And that's why we have to be moving these bees around, because they have to two weeks here, two weeks here, two weeks here. That's how we grow food in this country. Um, for better or for worse, for better if you like feeding a whole lot of people cheaply, and for worse if you like to think about our environment and kind of the long term and, and, and where we're headed and, and what that might look like in the future. Understand the true cost and true meaning of sustainability. Um, again, you know, the honey that we sell is actually a surplus. These are not bees, whether they're, they're from our bees or from one of our suppliers, this is not honey from bees that are being fed back sugar to make up for what was harvested. The art of beekeeping is having the bees harvest all that stuff from, from the land and providing for themselves and providing for you at the same time. That's, that's, when, you, when, that's when you're doing it. And, um, and there's a cost to that. It means that you can't produce as much honey as if, as if you fed 100 pounds of sugar and harvested another 100 pounds of honey from that hive. Support important research that isn't supported by industry. Remember that industry, that 99% of the bees is 1% of the beekeepers. Um, and their interest is largely in that migratory pollination world, not in the wild bees that, that I was talking about. So that's, that's really what I have to, to share with you today. We, uh, we have a lot of projects that we're working on. We have some, um, some research projects that we're hoping to collaborate with, with some major labs um, in this coming year. And um, you know, we have bees all around Boston. We have bees at the Intercontinental, at the Lennox Hotel, and at the Fenway Victory Garden. Um, as you all know by now, we wrote the Completed Eats Guide to Beekeeping. Um, and um, we have some honey for you to taste. And what we've got today for honey, we do different kinds of tastings different times. We have three different kinds of honey, all from different places, all from different flowers, all from different beekeepers, all from different seasons. But they all look almost exactly the same, and they taste totally different, and they have totally different textures. Because it really is all about the flowers and not about the bees. So thank you very much. Yes. Yes, I have a uh, comment and a question. I don't mm -hmm. know how coincidental it was, but yesterday there was a problem on NPR about about plants or and uh, and also the, uh, the scientists said that the reason we we are all mass targeted with that is due to the fact that you know people well probably not like you now uh, due to the um, well, no, no, I mean, I mean, sustainable for what? Sustainable for the pollination that has to happen? Absolutely. That, that's the gig. So that was very interesting.
though the second question was back in 2000, I stumbled upon a book, and it was before this is written in 1923, that basically predicted colonic nerve disorder and was talking about like exact words, uh, you know, what was going to happen. And uh, I actually haven't read the book, I read a lot of is it the Steiner, the yeah, Steiner book? Yes. Okay. So, so he's talking about a, a, a Rudolf Steiner book in 1923 that that um, actually described colony collapse disorder. Well, I can one up you on that, and I, you know we should have brought that big that big um, poster. But and um, I, if you email me later, I'll, I'll I'll send you this document because it's amazing. It is a document from the Secretary of Agriculture, I think, in 1879. Was that it? 1860-something, 1870-something. And it describes colony collapse disorder to a T, happening, you know, the, you know the, these kinds of boom and bust cycles are common in insects. You know, we even see it, you know, in the Bible with locusts. And, you know, that, that's how insects kind of live. And um, so I, I, I can one-up Steiner and, and show you actually the Secretary of Agriculture describing, not predicting it, but it happening. And so I, I don't find it that surprising because it is kind of what happens when things break down. Um, it's, uh, you know, Steiner was an interesting guy. Um, so some of the, some of the information's a little bit, a, a little bit wishy-washy, but um, I don't know that it, uh, you know, sir, he certainly wasn't the only one to, to consider that, it, that, that industry and nature um, are oftentimes at odds. Um, and that one's going to beat down the other eventually. Yes. Yeah. I don't. I don't disagree with it. I. I, I agree that that we're humans and human nature. We're we're not we're not at a place in our human nature where we can give nature its due, um, and that's always going to end in some kind. That's always going to cause problems and disaster and conflict. Um, I don't know that it takes um, real. Pre, you know. You know, I don't know that it takes real prescience to, to predict disaster. The disaster is always around the corner. Any other questions or comments? Or? Okay, well, if you'd like to come up, we'll do some honey tasting. And if you'd like to have your book signed, we can do that as well. And I appreciate you all coming. And thank you, Jonathan, for bringing us in. Sure. Thank you.